and welcome to season two of Slack Chat on YouTube. Uh, I'm Stuart Winter and we have Phil. Hi, Phil. Hello, Stuart. Hey. So we've moved to YouTube so we can change the format up a little bit because we kind of run out of road, really, with the podcast and what we could really talk about. And what we can do now is start showing you what we're actually working on, showing you the machines booting up, showing you how the installer works and also showing you some insights behind the scenes. How is the development of the ARM port done? How is it maintained? If you haven't listened to season one yet, you'll find that on the Slackware ARM YouTube channel as well. We'll introduce ourselves a little bit later, but to begin with, I'll give you a potted history of the Slackware Linux distribution. Slackware was derived from a distribution called SLS, which stood for Soft Landing Systems. And it was created by Patrick Volkerding and first released back in 1993. At the present time, in 2021, Slackware is 28 years old. So, you know, you could say that it's one of the grandfathers in the Linux world, as it's the longest actively maintained Linux project. There have been official ports of Slackware to the DEC and later Compaq Alpha, uh, the SunSpark, the IBM S3 mainframe and ARM. After the official development of the Spark and Alpha ports stopped, they were picked up and maintained by the community for a number of years. But the only official port that remains is the ARM port. I did a presentation um, about Slackware at FOSTEM in Brussels in 2005. And at that time, as you can see, there were 552 main packages in Slackware and 128 in the extra directory. So there were 680 packages in total in 2005 in Slackware 10.1. As of Slackware 15, there are almost 1,700. So you can see there's a continued development there. If you're particularly interested in Slackware, the Wikipedia page is pretty good. There's a lot of really good information in there about the history and the development process. Some of that will go into as you move through this video series. Slackware really is the most Unix-like of all of the Linux distributions still around meaning that when you learn Slackware, you'll learn a core set of transferable Unix skills that will make you feel more easily at home on other Unix variants. For me personally, I've always loved Unix ever since I was about 15 or 16. I'm now 40. And having learned Slackware allowed me to easily go on to other Unix variants like Solaris, AIX, BSD, and some of the other ones. Because of the fact you need to get under the covers, you need to start working with the Unix environment. And because Slackware actually really has a minimal set, a minimal set of tools that orchestrate the actual distribution itself. And we'll go into these as we go through. But the fact that you have that you, you really have to get into the system and start understanding how it works and start using the tools that really does allow you to learn a lot more and be comfortable in other Unix environments. If you particularly like that kind of thing, which I do now. So the Slackware website. Yes, we know it's old. We know a lot of the information on there is out of date. We're fully aware of that. We're also aware that it needs TLS support and a few other things. So those will be fixed eventually. However, despite the website, the distribution itself is up to date. You can follow the progress of Slackware by looking at the development stream, which is what we call Slackware current. And you can have a look at that by clicking on here. So I will pick, say, the x86 architecture and you can see that it's currently up to date and it's been regularly updated as well. So you can see the timestamps here. At one point in Slackware's history, it was part of the commercial Unix and Linux industry and it had a paid development team. But now Slackware is funded directly by the user base and there's now an international development team of, of volunteers that's remained stable for probably over 10 years at this point and more in some cases. Some of the team are known to the community and others aren't. So just briefly on the Slackware philosophy, Slackware basically gets out of your way and it lets you do what you want. One of the hallmarks and the reasons why I've used Slackware for almost 25 years at this point is because of its consistency. What this means is, is that you can learn the core operating system and have a set of skills that you can use for decades, all whilst having an up-to-date Linux environment that provides a platform you to just get on and do stuff where really the operating system keeps behind the curtain and doesn't pop up and bug you. So that what you see on the screen share here is actually running Slackware current using KDE5, the Plasma. So I've got a very up-to-date system here in front of me. 
one of the reasons why I really like this is because it means that once I've learned the core operating system, I don't need to relearn the core operating system every time there's a new release of Slackware. You know, not that much in terms of the Slackware experience, it's, it's pure Slackware changes. So KDE, for example, will change as the KDE developers change it, but the core Slackware distribution, it, it changes, it does get developed, it does change, but the way you use it remains the same. One of the reasons why I personally find that particularly enjoyable to use is because, for example, when you look at it objectively, if you are like me and, and if you're a regular user, really what you want to do is you want to install packages, remove packages, upgrade packages, and maybe you want to do a few other bit of house maintenance or something like that. But the thing is, what you really want to use a system for is for actually doing things. You want to do web browsing, you want to edit videos, you want to do lots of other tasks on that platform. But you don't really want to have to go and relearn how to use a new packaging tool or some, you know, if some core part of the system changes. As a user, you want to use the, the system. You don't want to have to go and relearn how to use all of the components again. To me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So that's why I've stuck with Slackware for so long, because it allows me to do what I want to do. The way Slackware is built is that it expects you to want to go and learn. It expects you to put a bit of time in, as you had to do back in the early days of Unix and Linux. The entire core of the Slackware operating system management suite is actually written in Unix shell, which means that anybody who knows Unix can figure it out and it can customize it pretty easily. Also, I think it's a testament to Unix itself that the entire core can be written in shell. So, all, for example, all of the package management tooling, they're all written in shell. Everything is the initialization scripts, everything. So it makes it, from a user's point of view, very easy to go in. And if you start looking at some of the Slackware scripts, they're pretty simple, they're well commented, and it's pretty straightforward. And in fact, I learned uh, personally, when I started using Slackware, I think in 97 or 1998, I, I learned more using Slackware in a couple of weeks than I learned using Red Hat in maybe four years, because I had to, and because it's so easy to understand what's going on by just reading the script. So just a moment on the Slackware community. The Slackware user base is globally distributed. There's an international user base. There are also a number of community groups on Facebook. There's one on Reddit, and there's also a Usenet group. The official Slackware support forum is, is on linuxquestions.org, which you can see here on the browser. And this is a very active forum, so that there are constantly posts here. It's a free service. You can sign up, get a free account, and you can ask questions. So if you're new to the distribution, create an account here, log in and say hello if you have any questions. One of the great things about this is that the Slackware development team do look at this forum, and we do reply quite often to many of the posts as well. So there's a really good level of engagement there. Right, so this Slackware on video channel, it's really about showing you what's going on behind the covers. It's about giving more back to the community. And I'm really excited to show you how things work on the inside. You know, how do I actually upgrade the ARM port? How do I bring in the changes from x86? And one of the things that really excites me and excites Phil as well, we'll say hi to Phil in a moment, um, is we're gonna be discussing the development of the Slackware ARM 64-bit port called ARCH64. And during this video series, I'm gonna be showing you how things work and you're gonna definitely see some really old school Unix ways of doing things, I'm pretty sure about that. One of the things that I want to point out is at this point is that if you're particularly new to Linux, you'll probably see me doing some of these old school ways. And you might say, ah, but you can do it far more efficiently if you do it like this. And if you to me, the way I look at it is if you're writing a script, you should make them as efficient as possible, particularly on ARM, because it really does improve the speed if you can make a more efficient script. However, one of the things about being an old school Unix admin is that you learn the core set of skills. And for example, if you were went to if you went to Solaris, you'd find that many of the, the options to the GNU tool sets don't exist on the Solaris Unix system. So one of the, the things about this is, is that if you really understand the core tool sets and you, for example, you, you know, you learn how to construct tools using pipelines and that kind of thing, you'll see me going through and working using some of these old school ways. So a little bit about us. Who are we? Well, I'm Stuart Winter. I'm the platform architect for Slackware Arm. 
It's been almost 20 years now of developing Slackware on the ARM architecture. I began porting Slackware to ARM in 2002, and uh, it was first released in 2005. I've been a Unix sysadmin, you know, back in the day, and I worked for Red Hat for a number of years there and worked as a web security operations manager at Cisco. Now I'm a technical consultant at Akamai. I tell you that because that shapes the types of things I'm going to be saying. It shapes my approach. You know, I'm more of an engineering systems, back-end architecture kind of guy. So it's also why I really love Slackware, because I'm not too much into GUIs. <laughs> as you can see with the presentation, I'm more of a, right, I've got a platform. I know what I've got on it. I'm going to start gluing things together and making things work. That's really how I look at things. I'm more of a, uh, yeah, more of a systems kind of terminal type of guy in general. And Phil, and Phil maintains SARPI, which is a Slackware ARM community project, which what that project does is it facilitates the installation of Slackware ARM onto the Raspberry Pi by providing a set of documentation and some helper scripts and tools to get Slackware ARM up and running on the Raspberry Pi. So hi, Phil. Hello, Stuart. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Good stuff. It's good to talk to you back. We haven't done a podcast episode for a while, so it's really good to talk to you again. Yeah, good to hear you got- too, man. We've got loads of exciting episodes coming up. I'm really pleased that we've been able to leave the audio only podcast behind because it started to really limit what we could actually do and what we could talk about. And also, I just wanted to thank you as well for bringing SARPI alive and maintaining it for all this time because you started it in 2011, didn't you? It's 2012 that it started. 2012? Yeah. Ah. It was discussed from 2011, sort of October, November, when we got Oh, news. you were planning it, right. Yeah, we got news of the Raspberry Pi device, and then development actually started October 2012. Okay. Well, thanks so much for doing that, because, you know, the Raspberry Pi on ARM is one of the biggest entry points into the distribution. So, yeah, I started the ARM port of Slackware back in 2002, and its first release was in 2007. Now, part of the reason why it took five years to make a release was since the ARM hardware was nowhere near the speeds that we have today. The core packages, GCC, uh, glibc, the kernel, and a huge amount of the the larger package set needed patching because ARM was still very new back in that time. And so a lot of it just didn't build. It didn't know about ARM. And so there was a lot of work to do. And that's one of the reasons why it took so long to get it going. Thankfully, the ARCH64 port will not take five years. It'll probably take a few months. And, you know, Slackware itself, whilst it had been ported to the Spark and Alpha machines, the progenitor platform was always a 32-bit x86. And the build system, all the build scripts, were hard-coded for 32-bit x86. Back in that time at 2002, building operating systems from source wasn't a thing. You know, there was no Gen 2 and Linux from scratch had just been released around that time. And there was no support for ARM either, as really the ARM Linux ecosystem was nowhere close to being able to build anything from any kind of reliable recipe. You had to get things all over the place. And I mean, literally, in the case of when I started Slackware ARM on the strong arm on the Acorn strong arm with PC, whether or not you had a working bootloader for Linux depended on whether the guy who developed it liked you or not. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not making this up. So. You know, it was it was all pretty, pretty tricky at the time to get all the pieces together. And that took a long time. And also back at the time, finding patches and getting help was really quite a different experience than it is today. So because of all this, I had to also create a new set of build scripts that really gave me the freedom to create what I needed to do, including a whole bunch of tools, which some of which I'll show you on these videos. At that time as well with Slackware, some of the package build scripts didn't actually create packages. Because a number of the package build systems simply weren't designed with operating system vendors in mind. They were just developers that built something. That was it. You configured it and it installed to the file system. So back in the day, Slackware had a few what we called dot build scripts, which would compile and do a make install and install the package onto the file system. So I also had to write a script to handle those packages and package those up as well. So Patrick gave me his old what what he called the BP script that that he built to handle those and i wrote a packaging tool called slack track which you can find in the slackware d series to build packages from those build scripts the slackware installer image was also manually maintained by patrick and didn't contain any of the up-to-date versions of tools so 
because I wanted the full Slackware experience, which includes the installer, I had to deconstruct the installer and wrote a new build script to recreate the installer for, for ARM, including a few ARM tweaks. So just, you know, that when you exit the installer, it asks you to reboot uh, and it reboots the system. How it used to be is you had to do control alt delete, but on ARM, you can't do that when it's you're installing it over a serial console. You can't do control alt delete. So I'd make various, I've made changes like that to the installer, which are now in the x86 installer and a whole bunch of other things to make Slackware work on the ARM platform. The installer script itself, by the way, is actually now in the Slackware source tree. And it's largely the original version that I made for ARM with some improvements by Alien Bob when he did the Slackware x86-64 port. We'll be looking at the installer at some point as well, particularly when we get to building the ARCH64 port of Slackware. So yeah, it took about five years of groundbreaking work and I'm really pleased that it's not gonna take that long anymore, particularly because I've got all of the infrastructure, or pretty much most of it set up for ARCH64 already. There are also so many ARM devices which all require some kind of customization and documentation. Whereas unlike on the x86, where you know you can put in say a USB device or just boot from the network, and have a good time. You install it because that's because the x86 platform is very consistent across vendor hardware. ARM's not quite like that. It's getting there. It's much better than it ever used to be. But what that means is that it's not possible for me personally to provide support for each and every device out there. That's simply not possible. The way that I do it is that I pick some devices that I'm particularly interested in. I get Slackware working on them. I create an installation path, a set of methods that you can use directly, follow, and you'll be able to install Slackware ARM on that particular hardware. For everything else, I put out to the Slackware community, which is how Phil and I got talking in the first place. So Phil saw that and started adding Raspberry Pi support using the Slackware community as a platform to do that. And what I'd provide is the full Slackware operating system and for you to be able to do that. So if you're really interested, for example, and you see a new piece of ARM hardware coming out, you know, pop onto this Slackware ARM forum on Linux questions and you can ask about it. Um, as it stands for the moment for the 32-bit version of Slackware, I'm not going to be adding any new hardware to that because that doesn't really make sense to do so at this point in time because th there's no new hardware that's particularly interesting. However, for ARCH64, there is a future there in terms of what's what's available. So I do expect personally to be adding in extra pieces of hardware because I just like buying hardware, <laughs> which brings me to the next piece of I think, why ARM? Well, ARM hardware these days is really cheap. And um, when I say cheap, I mean, you can get, for example, a Rock Pro 64 for under 100 US dollars. You know, you can buy some extra stuff for it. But this is, a, and also for Raspberry Pi, Phil. I mean, how much are the Raspberry Pis? You are looking at $35 for the two gigabyte version RPI, uh, Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, $55 for the Raspberry Pi for four gigabyte and $75 for the eight gigabyte version. Okay, so there we go. Yeah, and, and it's, it's really cheap. So, it, however, it, it's cheap, but it's also stable. I've had my ARM hardware running for years and the only problems I've actually ever had with them are power supply units, which is actually a separate piece anyway. So I've replaced the power supplies. And in some cases, I power them directly from a from a USB port that I have in the power socket on the wall. So the actual hardware itself is very stable. And as you'll see, as we go through, it's also pretty quick, even on the 32 bit arm. The hardware will also get faster with ARCH64 because it's faster hardware. So it's, it's solid, it's stable, it's reliable. There are many use cases for Slackware ARM. One of the other things as well with ARM hardware is that it's generally very low power. So there's lots of use cases here, things like home gateways, NASes, routers. Personally, I have my home gateway server runs Slackware ARM 14.2. And one of the targets for the Slackware ARCH64 port is the Pinebook Pro, which is a laptop. So at some point, I'm going to be having Slackware ARM 64 running on a laptop. And I'm really looking forward to that because that was one of the first things. So originally, my idea was to get Slackware ARM running on the Strong ARM RISC PC because I'd spent a lot of money on it. And it's, it was a nice, really nice piece of hardware. And I did, I got it working on there. I managed to get Window Maker, the desktop environment, running on there. It was incredibly slow though. I thought that it would be fast because uh, RISCOS, which is the native operating system for the RISC PC, was really fast. 
However, that was also written in mostly assembler and it was tuned to the hardware, whereas Linux wasn't at the time, so it was incredibly slow. So I'm really looking forward to being able to use a fast ARM laptop with Slackware running on it. I can't wait. So this concludes it for this episode. In the next episode, I'm going to show you how I push the updates for Slackware ARM 14.2. So it's goodbye from me. And a very goodbye from me. And remember, as they say, like and subscribe. If you've got any ideas and suggestions, let us know in the comments. Thanks.